Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a small group here at the Walnut Hills Branch Library, and we have even more people online. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to start by saying, on behalf of the friends of the Harry Beecher Stowe House, we respectfully acknowledge that the ground on which we stand are traditional Miami and Shawnee lands. We extend our esteem and gratitude to the indigenous people who call this place home. Good morning. My name is Christina Hartley, and I'm the executive director here at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. And we are coming to you today live from the beautiful Walnut Hills Branch Library, and then also from your own homes, so that we can have this great discussion. The semicolon club sponsor for this discussion series, I know I have to get all the logistics out of the way, but uh, is Donna's fabulous Beaufort. Uh, born from a love of animals and the idea that fashion could be cruelty free, Donna Salyers founded Fabulous Furs over 30 years ago. It's headquartered in Covington and she designs and manufactures luxury faux fur coats, vests, throws, and much more. You can visit their website at fabulousfurs.com to learn more. And with that, we are in the semicolon club. We are discussing this book. Let me see that one. The Doctors of Blackwell, even if you haven't read the full book or even if you haven't started it yet, it's okay because we're going to provide lots of background information and lots of interesting things. And there was like some surprising things that happened in the last few chapters, which I uh, skimmed last night because I had not completely finished it yet. Uh, but there were some surprising things in the last few chapters. And I was like, whoa, really? I thought I knew one about Blackwell sisters, but apparently not. So um, I'm going to turn it over to our discussion leader for today, who is our longtime volunteer, Desiree Willis. And um, we'll go for about an hour or so, and maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. And hopefully we'll get lots of cool participation. Um, if you want to say something, all you have to do is unmute yourself and say it. Um, if you feel like you need to raise your hand either virtually or in you know like with an actual hand go for it i'll kind of monitor who's who's up and wants to say something and haven't hasn't gotten in yet so all right take it away okay first of all hello to Ann pat <laughs> but i'm glad you supervising us <laughs> well yeah that's right so the book uh, was a doctor's blackwell and i guess i'm i mean i i don't know i didn't realize some people hadn't read it so I, should I do a quick a quick summary of Elizabeth Blackwell? She is. Is everybody the Blackwell? Just, just do a quick summary. Okay. okay. So the Blackwells were a prominent family in the Little Water Hills, pretty much next door to the Beecher. They're on Gilbert Avenue. Um, they came to Cincinnati about the same time. Um, Elizabeth would become the first woman doctor in America, um, and her sister would follow behind her shortly later. Um, and she also had two brothers who were very big in the suffrage movement, which come into play in this book, which really kind of was a huge, I, I knew about the brothers because obviously I do the suffrage tour, um, but I was surprised about Elizabeth's attitude towards that whole situation, which we'll get into more. She's almost more like Catherine. <laughs> and she's the Catherine Beecher of the Black Hills. That's what I, I, I um, tagged her, yeah. Um, but yeah, but Elizabeth becomes the first uh, doctor. Um, her she and her sister start a hospital in New York City, and the book uh, basically parallels their journey or has, tells you about their journey into medicine, what got them there, um, how they got there, what happened afterwards, and it kind of talks about their relationship as sisters and how they work together and then uh, find their own voices in different ways. So with that, I guess we'll just start with the discussion. Uh, for those who actually were able to read the book, uh, I'll open it up with, give me your thoughts on the book, general thoughts. Let's just start there. Did you like it? Did you hate it? I thought it was it? interesting. Um, I somehow, I didn't know this, that Mary Blackwell ended up living in England for the rest of her life. Like. That's never discussed in when whenever she's talked about in American history, the fact that she was like, nope, I'm going back home to Britain. <laughs> and um, 
And also uh, the part where her sister Emily adopts a child in the 19th century and everyone's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> The child too. Yeah, she will. That that's been one of the things I felt was very. I guess from there, yeah. Which is very odd for because one of the things about black women are very well known in the abolitionist community, and she basically adopts this child as her servant and tells her she could never marry. Then she has to stay with her her whole life. But I was like, wait a minute, for an abolitionist just because you give it for adoption doesn't make it non-slavery. I just thought that was really bizarre, but she was good to Kitty, but I thought it was very strange. Mm -hmm. Kelly, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. I was just going to share that I did not love the audiobook narrator. I don't know if anybody else tried to listen to the audiobook, but I was going to listen to it on my commute, and I just had the hardest time kind of getting into her style of narration or something like that. Um, so that kind of hindered me a tiny bit, and I think I'm going to have to get a hard copy of this book to really be able to experience it the way I want to. We still have um, a few hard copies in the bookstore that I had not used, so uh, they're fairly cheap if you wanted to come and get one. I will be checking that out, yes. Any other? Uh, well, I actually did like the book. I thought it was very fascinating in terms of it really provided a lot of background information on specifically more on Elizabeth than Emily, but uh, a lot of background information in terms of how she, you know, went from being a teacher to going to medical school. And then the experiences that she had in Europe, I had no idea that she was blind in one eye and that, you know, that, that was an, ex you know, some, a, disease that she had caught at a maternity hospital in France and basically her one of her eyes like completely disintegrated and so she had a glass eye for most of her life and I was like I had no idea uh so that was you know just that dynamic and then the dynamic between the sisters and the way that she was always pushing the way she's always pushing Emily it really, she really is this big much like Catherine <laughs> 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 And so uh, it really, um, but then the thing that surprised me, and I did not, I didn't, I skimmed the last few chapters. So uh, that was last night because uh, I just ran out of time. But, um, you know, in skimming them, I really were, I had, I also did not, was not aware of the fact that the sisters ended up in separate places for like the last 40 years of their careers. Mm -hmm. And so they worked together initially, but then they separated again. And so they were both doing their things in, in other places. And so that was surprising to me because I always link them together in my mind. Yeah. You know, the Black Little Sisters, but they, you know, they led very different trajectories once they got, you know, past their training and opening their hospital and so forth. So those were my initial impressions. Anyone else want to go? Amy, go ahead. Well, I apologize. I bit off more than I can chew this week. So I'm about a third or a, like maybe a fourth of the way through. So I haven't finished. But likewise, I was surprised that Elizabeth, um, how she lost her vision. But I will say this week I was reading, um, I was in a poetry group and we read Christina Rossetti and apparently there was a large um, like reformation of prostitutes in Europe at about that same time. So I was a little less surprised. It was just sort of a weird like concurrence of books on that particular, you know, that particular theme. So it was weird. Um, the other thing that surprised me was Elizabeth's view on women's suffrage. I thought, well, here, you know, you consider yourself and you are, and, you know, she was, if I could talk to her about it, um, an incredibly intelligent and talented woman, but she didn't seem to want to extend that to other people, which I thought was strange. And she didn't seem to think that they also might have hidden or unrevealed talents if given the opportunity. So I was kind of very surprised by that. Me, like, like, I can see that and I felt the same way about Catherine. You know, Catherine had this amazing career. She treated with a lot of her. 
I draw a lot of parallel between the Blackwell sisters and the Beecher sisters. Or, and then the Blackwells and the Beechers, the family, just uh -huh. both families were very close to each other. Both families were known to like write to each other and like cast letters around their families discussing things. Uh, and just the dynamics were so similar. It was just really bizarre to me. And I was just like, I felt like um, Elizabeth and Emily were Catherine and Harriet. <laughs> They, they had the same kind of dynamic. And I couldn't find it as a bell or really, maybe the Anna, maybe the report, one of the two. Mm -hmm. But not, she wasn't quite as right. old as Isabel. But then, like, the it was just very bizarre to mm -hmm. me. Both of the brothers, uh, Henry, but the Blackwell brothers, and then several of the other brothers were involved in the suffrage movement. So it just was kind of like, wow, they were very similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they lived, again, they lived they next door each other. Two blocks away. Well, no, I, 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 I mean, probably those times I think it was next door. Maybe. Right. No, it, it would have been, there wouldn't have, I don't think there were any houses in between them. Really? Um, just, just kind of to catch people up, if you had not read the book and we talked about the connection between prostitution and Emily's eyesight and oh. what, or like, yes, Elizabeth's eyesight. And what happened basically is she was working in a maternity hospital, like a low income, you know, destitute people's maternity hospital. And, um, and uh, this is something that I did not know, but when um, the child is born, comes through the birth canal of a mother that has is it, is it gonorrhea? gonorrhea. Yeah, it was gonorrhea. Um, then they have something develops in their eyesight that that messes it up and so like the i guess the they get a, a really bad form of conjunctivitis mm -hmm. and then that material as their eye that's why we give erythromycin to babies now it's mandated in the state of ohio and from across the country oh, okay to this day it, I, I was at a hospital and they told me so um so this had happened she had she had dealt with the she you know, how to deliver this baby, and then the the something happened with the, the baby, like the juices splashed up or something into Elizabeth's eye, and so she got the conjunctivitis as well. And it, <clears throat> for months of battling it, they finally just removed what was left of her eye, gave her a glass eye. I, I was fascinated by that uh, because the author seems a little a little skeptical of medicine in Paris, <laughs> given that that's what happened. I I was really impressed by this notion that the people in the maternity hospital knew right away that she had been splashed, that there was a danger, that they cleaned her eyes, and, and, and it was many months before she actually lost her vision, and then that, that there was sufficient surgery to remove the infected eye and put in a glass eye. I, mean, I just I just think that speaks uh, to extremely sophisticated mm -hmm. medicine and that in general European medicine was was by that time uh, much more sophisticated than American medicine. And I don't think that's appreciated. Right. No. And I just think what a blessing in it was just one eye and not both. Right, right. right. Yeah. Because that would have basically been ended, been ended career in terms of yeah. And I think down to your point, I, I think it's the other maybe she had trouble because she's looking at medicine today. But at that time it was like, you know, what they did was pretty amazing. I'm sure just a few years earlier they probably couldn't have done what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, medicine really rapid. Advanced rapidly in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Any other additional comments, or do you want to kind of pose another question for us? Uh, well, I guess uh, I, we have the Harry Beecher Stowe House in Cincinnati. I did want to start with the beginning uh, with her life in Cincinnati and how people who thought that her. Um, because Elizabeth in particular, her life was formed from her life in Cincinnati and her experiences here. Um, 
for those who, I guess, didn't who weren't aware of it, I'll just to give you a little background. Um, there were five Lundell sisters, I think. Yes. Well, yeah, five. But none of them ever married. Um, her two brothers did marry, but they both married very luminous women. I mean, um, there is, and for those of you who sit on my supper story, you'll know they actually took oath in front of the community to always treat their wives as equal partners and allow their wives to maintain all of their property. And they did all this very publicly. Um, so the, no, but everybody knew that they were equal to their wives. It was no, uh, well, I'm sure back then they suffered a lot of ridicule. Ridicule, thank you. So yeah, so I'm just kind of curious what how people think that her life in Cincinnati, her she it was friend, they were friends with the Beechers, how all that may have affected her future. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I mean, that's an interesting question, Desiree, because the author spent so much time describing their father as being very kind of radical in his belief systems as well. And I think a lot of that has to do with how he raised his daughters. Um and giving them a chance to have an education, I think was huge. And and I don't know if them coming in contact with the Beechers just kind of like set them further on a path they would have gotten onto anyway. Um, it's kind of a chicken and the egg type question, I suppose, because <laughs> they all seemed very stubborn women who would have done whatever they felt like doing, basically, even if it was in England. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Could they have influenced the Beecher women? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, possibly. I mean, just that you know, they 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 were here in the eighteen late eighteen thirties at the same time as the Beecher sisters, and basically, it feels like they started their teaching and schools at about the same time that the Beecher sisters' school shut down. So it was almost like they were kind of passing the baton to the Blackwells, and I found it really, you know. Another parallel between Harriet and the Blackwell sisters is, you know, all of a sudden they don't have a male breadwinner in their midst because their father died. And so the older sisters have to go to work to support the family. You know, the young, the, the two oldest brothers, Samuel and Henry, are still like young teenagers. So they start like apprenticeships, but really the, the sisters have to start making money for the family so that they don't, you know, become destitute. So it really, in a way that parallels Harriet, you know, just supplementing her husband Calvin Stowe's income because he doesn't get paid as much as Carter should. But um, yeah, I, I think... It feels like, and you know, we don't know how often they visited each other. We don't know, you know, what their specific dynamics were, but just the fact that they were on the same street, you know, Harriet would have walked by their house every other day or so as she was going from her house to her family's home. And, you know, they're, they're, it just feels like they would have had a lot of contact and would have had a lot of, you know, discussions that we just don't know what they talked about. When I, there was one conversation where Harriet and Elizabeth discussed Elizabeth becoming a woman now. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was, you know, Harriet kind of was like, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. Like, you know, you go ahead, good for you, girl. You go, you you you, you go for it. It's like, I don't know. So, uh, so we know that, you know, it's like and we know historically the Blackwells and the Beechers did work together in the suffrage movement and the abolition movement, so there kind of been a close relationship there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think another parallel um, the the Beechers were in the midst of all this religious controversy, and that the Blackwells actually the reason their school failed, as far as I can tell. Is because they became Unitarians, <laughs> and, the, and the the people who were sending their daughters to this school did not want the Unitarian influence, and so this is just another another parable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else online want to jump in with something?
Um, this is Mary Ann Fisher, and um, I'm only part way through the book, um, but I'm also at the same time partly through Free Thinker, which is Mary Alice Chenoweth which I got through one of your programs at the Mercantile when you had someone there, The Best Medicine with Perry Class. So I got this other book and it's by Kimberly Hamlin from Miami University. And so I'm reading about both of these women and Mary Alice Chenoweth comes to Cincinnati for the normal school certification and she's going to go on to be working with uh, Miss Stanton, and so I should just say that I'm I'm with two ladies who are strongly influenced through their path through Cincinnati, and I'm kind of enjoying that. Um, the other thing, adding a point that I don't know is relevant, but just throwing it out there. Um, there was a family of Bailey sisters who ran a school and they were Swedenborgian and they knew these people. And the other ones that come into mind was when you just mentioned, I didn't know the Unitarian, but there was a family of Carlisle's and all the women were Swedenborgian, but the men were Unitarian. So that's something to interest a George Carlyle. And um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm gonna follow that a little bit, the daughters and the mothers for four generations. And suddenly I looked at George Carlyle and thought, you're, you were the daughter of all these strong women, you know, that went on for generations. and. So I won't carry in on that, but I'm just saying I'm enjoying Cincinnati in the mid 18th century <laughs> or 19th century. Well, there is a, a direct connection with Elizabeth Cady Stanton in Cincinnati. And I don't know that she was ever here, but her husband, before he was her husband, was one of the Lane Rebels. Henry Stanton, Henry Stanton was one of the Lane Rebels. So he was an abolitionist, and then he gets married to this suffragist who's also an abolitionist, of course. Because the Actually, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. This is Sudeister. Um, there are Katie and Cutler connections from Massachusetts that settled in Oxford oh. that were related to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And the only reason I know is because I'm their descendant. So it gets it gets really complicated where you have to go back and figure out where did people come from and in what groups and you see this intermingling. It's it's something that I've been researching for the last 10 years, and it is just fascinating how these people would leave Massachusetts, Connecticut and New Jersey and intermingle up and down the Indiana and Ohio state lines and the connecting thread was always something dealing with Cincinnati. Cincinnati is really much more of a crossroads of civilization than most people would give us credit for, right? Definitely. Okay. But I guess, you know, let's, let's take in the comments before we kind of go into themes. I guess let's start with the most, uh, to me, the, the most jarring one was her view on women and women's rights. What people saw, I mean, I was, for me, I was absolutely shocked <laughs> that she was so much against opposed to women's rights. She thought the suffragists were frivolous and silly and would love to have been at the family home on Christmas after her brother married two of the prominent suffragists in America because I'm sure it was wonderful um, because they might not appreciate her opinion of the suffrage movement, but we don't have that story in the book, so. <laughs> but I'm just like, really, what are you? Thoughts when you read that, that you know, she really despaired, or she, she didn't care much for the women's rights movement, and kind of how she had view of it. And, I, and the other one is she always talked a lot about lifting women up, but yet she didn't actually support the movement that would do that. So I guess that 
before even having heard this, but I can't understand how you could forge your way through and not want to, to bring others with you or to make paths for them. Like even for me, did I find it? Well, she, she needed to make a path for her own sister, but not necessarily other people. Other, right? And I think, and I think maybe that went a little bit to her. I felt like she was very elite. Like she, she thought, well, I'm really smart. I can do this, but maybe not ever. Which is also interesting because even though you know, formalized medicine and medical training was not always using the best practices of what we would consider medicine today. And they were, you know, I mean, the training program was like 16 weeks and then you go work, you know, as an apprenticeship and then 16 weeks and then you work it as an apprenticeship and boom, now you're a fully licensed medical doctor. And it's like, it, but instead, you know, you have people who had been, you know, trained as midwives for centuries or, well, longer than that, but you get the idea. But, you know, you have midwives who had trained at their mother's and aunt's and, and so forth's knee and, you know, but they were not considered medical professionals. Instead, it was going through this process of getting a medical diploma. And that's what Elizabeth was like, I have to do that to get the medical diploma and yet she even admitted that a lot of their their ideas were not right and she was using more homeopathic things within that and i'm gonna let amy go next go ahead amy. Oh. oh no i wanted you to finish <laughs> i was done she was very elite well, along those same lines, Christina, since you just mentioned the midwives, midwives are traditionally women. I think they're almost exclusively women. And so, you know, obstetricians, male obstetricians are sort of a new phenomenon. Like for millennia, women were the birthing coaches. And suddenly, since you had to be certified to be a doctor, that entire history of knowledge was debased and devalued and less valuable somehow, even though strangely it's worked all this time, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then for Elizabeth, like there's a, and it's in the footnotes and I tried to find it before I clicked on that the author sort of um, analogizes her views to W.E.B. Du Bois, like, and I know we read that once in one of the Wednesday night discussions, about you know the top 10% are gonna bring everybody else along. I just couldn't find it fast enough. And yeah, so I thought that was, it's an interesting perspective. She's in a male dominated field, which you know many people, many women find themselves in a male dominated field. So you kind of get that, but her elitism that like she could hack it and other people couldn't possibly hack it. So why would we even let them vote if they can't think independently? Like, you have no idea what someone's going to do in the voting booth. You have no idea what hidden views she may be hiding for her own safety, that in the privacy of the voting booth, she's going to do whatever she needs to do. And I just found it like you, I found it confound, like both of you, it's confounding to me. Mm -hmm. um yeah, I mean, it keeps saying page 66. Okay, yeah, so she compares it to, uh, or she calls it, uh, let's see. Yeah. Let me go. Let me go. Because it was like one eighth. Um, the talented tenth, please. Right, the talented tenth was W.E.B. Du Bois's. Uh, how he explained how the the African Americans were going to to become more intellectually stable, or you know, the talented tenth was going to rise up the rest of the the African Americans, and that she says, okay, I'm on the right page, but I can't find it. Oh, the there are a few strong ones a sort of exceptional eighth perhaps yes yeah that's if they if they could be united it would be a good beginning you are one millie and some time or other we must work together though the way does not seem clear yet 
So an exceptional aid. So instead of 10%, she's like the top 12% kind of, but it's, yeah, it's very, very similar word, you know, similar idea. And we do, W.E.B. Du Bois would have said that like 50, 60 years later. Well, what's interesting also on page 237, um, when they're talking about founding their, their medical college for women, um, in their public address, they say women have no business habits. Girls are seldom drilled thoroughly in anything. They're not trained to use their minds any more than their muscles. They seldom apply themselves with a will and a grip to master any subject. And it's kind of interesting that they're saying they're funding their school to kind of combat this. <laughs> um, so I don't know if her there, if this was Emily coming in going, hey, let's change our message a little bit or or what. But I mean, the fact that they started a school that was considered very rigorous training for its day says a lot about the Blackwell sisters and I guess how they thought women should be progressing. Well, doesn't that also compare to Catherine Beecher in terms of educating girls in math and science and languages in her schools? And we don't want to just teach sewing and piano. We want to teach all of the subjects just like boys get and elevate the idea of housekeeping is not just, you know, pushing a broom around, it's actually a science. And so kind of raising that status as well. So again, there's this kind of parallel between the two families and the way they see women's education. Yeah, I thought that was, one of the things I thought was interesting was how after Elizabeth became a doctor, she seemed to have, once she finally got into college, a lot of men supported her, at least to a point. And they weren't going to put their rules on the line, but if they could get her into lectures or let her do things that, you know, they, they could help her, they could. They, they would. But because she got her diploma, it actually caused a backlash against women. And colleges, like, put things in place to keep any other women from getting into medical school. And then they opened up these women's medical schools, which were so far to the men's. And so then they used that as an excuse to keep the women out which is kind of why the black folks opened their college because they, they hated the women's colleges. Again, because, you know, they assumed women couldn't, you know, kind of a latest attitude. They had to have their education from men. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, I should, there's, a, there's another Cincinnati <laughs> connection, and interestingly. Uh, there was a woman uh, named Elmira Young Howard, mm -hmm. and she was, um, she was born in Ohio and in Cincinnati, but she ended up at the Blackwells Medical School. Okay. And like the Blackwells, she went to Europe after medical school. Um, but I think the idea that these women's medical schools were inferior is, is just not true. Well, and that's, yeah, that's the point. Were they? And I kind of wondered that. Were they inferior or was it just the Blackwells? Okay. Well, I think that if you look at the curriculum, uh, there was a women's medical college, a homeo homeopathic college in Philadelphia. Yeah, that was so in Philadelphia and Boston. Philadelphia and Boston. The in Philadelphia, they had to be college graduates, mm -hmm. and and they had a three year curriculum rather than the normal American two year curriculum. And, in Boston, um, Elmira Howard actually ventured a woman named Consuelo Clark, who was a black woman in Cincinnati. Her father was the principal of Gaines High School. Uh, Consuelo Clark talked about the three-year curriculum plus a year of practice in Boston after, after her medical training. And she came back and practiced in Cincinnati. Her, her medical training was equal to anything mm -hmm. that a man could get in Cincinnati. He was back at medical school mm -hmm. or a person had gone. So, so I think I think that once again, the, the the notion that because when medical schools were specialized in the 19 teens, all of the women's medical schools were closed, 
does not mean that the women's medical schools were in any way inferior. It means that the medical profession they wanted to be dominated by men. Right. I mean, that was something I wondered, like if she also was really down on the eclectic schools, medical schools, which was interesting because of the way she practiced medicine, she followed the eclectic schools more so than the medical school presidents. She was very much into hygiene and cleanliness and prevention. So it's like she was, but she couldn't allow herself to be wrong. And say, well, you know, my diploma is not as good as the my, you know, like that diploma had to mean something to her, and she like could not admit that her education was as good or maybe even not as good as what the eclectic students are getting. I, I don't know. Shelly, go ahead. Sorry, I'm forgetting this those is, people. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm 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 monitoring. Sorry, Shelly. Oh no, this is just a small point. Um about, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Dr. Ignat Semmelweitz, who had the very, very radical notion that you are killing babies if you don't wash hands before delivery. Um, this is, the reason that I bring this up is um, related to the point that you brought up about hygiene and kind of the general discussion about um, women's medical practices versus men's in this very tense time in the 19th century. And I'm not gonna give you a long lecture because I haven't worked out the complexities myself that, that um, I, this is probably gonna be a project that I'm gonna be getting into sort of um, women writing in, in medicine um, and medically related and health related topics um, in the 19th century. But I I, I think, you know, that's the, it's just I will just suffice it to say this, that it's very ironic to me that with this sort of male heist, if I can put it really bluntly, this sort of male heist of health and and um, well-being, especially with uh, with um, obstet obstetrics, um, that actually we've now had to reinvent things that 19th century women were doing all along. We now have, you know, a whole feel of integrative medicine. Oh, imagine you actually do these things that women did for centuries all along until in the latter 19th century, we had this sort of, quote, professionalization and, and industrialization of of medicine. So that's all. And it, I just think that everything we're talking about sort of re relates to that sort of um, real tension the, that the Blackwells really were part of this change that even as they were developing, even as they were being put on the map, um, I forget who it was that was saying that that the backlash, maybe it was you, Anne, that like suddenly when they were becoming known, you know, then it's like, okay, wait, now there has to be this backlash and this whole other thing in it. A really a lot was lost, I think. And I think some, for me, just like, the big thing that I got out of learning about the Blackwells is, or, you know, of, um, of reading through, and I've sort of just been skimming this book, but the, I've really gotten this sense that, you know, there was sort of knowledge and approaches that were almost lost, that we're kind of trying to have to recover right now in medicine. Okay, end of lecture. Okay, this is Katie. I went to a program a couple weeks ago at the Lloyd Library from their fellow, were you, were you there? Yeah, so she did She did a presentation yes. as of her screen. You wanted to, she talked about that doctor too, and I, I can't remember his name mm -hmm. either. Yeah. But well, John Yori, Yori Lloyd is a pharmacist, and that's, they were brothers, and that's where the Lloyd Library came from. And I don't remember yeah. the doctor's name, either, but it was the eclectic medicine movement and how it counteracted traditional medicine, which you might call male medicine, of doing really well things to people. And they were the more holistic, homeopathic. Mm. And it was like sleeping fortress before you had antibiotics and before you, you know, you kind of bringing the pandemic back to like things we just recently experienced where you did segregate, you had your, you kept your sick isolated. You, you did the simple things, cleanliness and, and good food and air and like, and it just seems like it, these things come full circle. They have a little peek in the door. And then we think we just 
we discover it all again. <laughs> but it, it's been there all along and just wasn't fully integrated. Mm -hmm. At least that's the takeaway I had. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said that was interesting. Yeah. Elizabeth chose those. That's exactly what she both have done. But if you would tell her, well, you're an eclectic doctor, she would tear her head. I mean, you're not an eclectic doctor. Remember, science doctor. No, you're not. You're not getting people's arms off when they have a you know, hand injury. Yeah. You're an eclectic doctor. <laughs> so, um, kind of go ahead, Marianne. This is Marianne Fisher again. Um, I'd like to mention I'm reading another book about Cincinnati, and it's by John Yuri Lloyd. Yes. And it is Epidorify. It's actually a science fiction that's taking place, but the Lloyd brothers were the Lloyd's library, and there's Dr. Scudders generationally that were in the Swedenborgian church. And I've only recently become familiar with that because I had church business on a letterhead I shared with a librarian. And she said, do you know what that is? And I'm like, no, but it was the letterhead of the eclectic printing, which is now the Lloyd's Library. And so as far as being homeopathic, um, yeah, the Swedenborgians, just to keep it in Cincinnati, if you know the wood carvers, the uh, fries, they came from England and they were vegetarians. So there was a, 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 and then you got that school. So I don't know when that started, but I know it was a publishing house and um, I'm just gonna have to know a lot more. <laughs> Well, Mar Marianne, there's there's a lot of work that's been done on the Swedenborgian church. There's a lot of stuff that if you go to Glendale, the now little chapel was one of the Swedenborgian churches. And there's a lot about how Johnny Appleseed had actually come here. Um, there, That's why there's a Johnny Appleseed monument in Spring Grove, because it's sitting in an area that was once one of his or apple orchards. And if you go further north to Mount Vernon actually, and Mansfield, you'll find I'm, his orchards so i i would like to invite you to come to the glendale church i have the front door key and <laughs> so i'm kind of the local historian um you know and yeah so there's a whole lot you're talking about and i just realized I have yeah so much information that i haven't had in you know a way to share it so if anybody wants to talk um, I'm gonna take I'll take you up on that offer. I'd love to get inside that church and see it. So oh um, my gosh. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> related to that. Um, but they're all connected um into the arts and um yeah, so I'm still sitting on a whole lot of primary documents um that I'd love to share. So I'll be quiet. I'd love yeah. to sit. Well, and I wanted to throw in too that we're making kind of a fuss about some of the stuff dealing with women and physicians. I, I worked when I was an undergrad for the professor who really headed up the history of medicine in the United States, uh, the late Dr. John Burnham, and he's written several books about the history of medicine and everything from the medical inspection of prostitutes in St. Louis to, you know, how science and superstition clashed. And um, one of the things that we, we have to like take our little selves out of is this assumption that these women were somehow unique because there are a lot of other women and, and I'm gonna throw my family back in here again. I have a great, great aunt who ended up in being the first women's physician for the Ohio State University Medical College. And Aunt Ada, took a roundabout way into getting into medicine. She was actually a school teacher and then she became a pharmacist and she and her husband operated a pharmacy. And then they moved to New Jersey where she obtained her medical training loosely. And this was in the early, late 19, 1800s, early 1900s. And she took this job with Ohio State in the late teens, early 20s. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you have to take yourself out of the uniqueness of this and realize there are a lot of other women in different locations 
trailblazing. It's it's more a question of how strong their character was, you know, how how much was their drive and their ambition, as opposed to looking at roadblocks and uniqueness. Um, and again, you know, in a lot of places, midwives were the physicians too. So keep that in mind. Can can I ask if I'm if, if I can be so bold? Um, since Marianne has mm -hmm. invited some folks, can we um can can we somehow like get the information in the chat or something like that? This just seriously sounds like a field trip has been inspired by this book club. Um, I would be delighted to put it in the chat. I'm um, um this will be like my second time ever leaving something in a chat. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I show that. Um, do yeah, you and Sue know each other from the past? No. Oh. That's what's interesting is that I, <laughs> I think we're we're like twins separated at birth, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> so I I graduated from Urbana University, and that was my connection to the Swedenborgian Church. Uh, the first female ordained in the Swedenborgian Church was the chaplain. She did my wedding. Uh, in actually digression, but she grew up in a Burnham house. Um, you know, so there is so many um, digressions I should go in and I, I, I won't, but um, I will go to the chat and share the information um, and leave it at that, but because I can get carried away. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I, I thought I, one of the interesting things in the book for me was not just the black ones, but other women health professionals discussed, specifically Florence Nightingale and Elizabeth's friendship with Florence Nightingale. Um, one, I mean, this is just one of my opinions is that these were two women that could have changed the face of women in medicine but it's almost like their own pride got in the way. Neither one would defer to the other. Um, you know, Nightingale was like, women should be nurses. Elizabeth was like, doctors, women should be doctors. And they couldn't find a way to work together. And it was real, I felt like that was a real shame that they both were so set in their ways. They couldn't like just both say it's okay for women to be nurses and doctors. And you, you know, let's work together to just bring women to medicine. And to stop worrying about what positions they hold. I don't know. Did anybody, anybody else's, how did they feel about the Florence Nightingale and Elizabeth Blackwell friendship? I mean, it really bothered me that these two amazing women couldn't work things out. Yeah, I always wondered what would have happened if they just like opened a hospital together. That's <laughs> <laughs> an amazing hospital. But yeah. know, they just, it's like my way or the highway for both of them. And it just kind of, I, I mean, I feel like doctors and nurses are both essential positions and they're different positions. So what is the problem? I think maybe uh, the problem for them was the fact where they had to jump through so many ridiculous hoops to get to where they were, that they were in, like, they had, like, just put blinders on themselves to get their own goals done. And then once it came to looking at what someone else was doing, they couldn't associate with that maybe do we uh, do y'all think that that was like common back then because women struggled so hard to advance in professions that when they got there it was like all about them whereas today we hear more about women being more cooperative and being mentors and bringing women up do you think women were doing it back then too or were they being more me, 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 because they didn't want to lose what they have. What's I, your... I am a pharmacist and I have just completed my 43rd year at my current job and only job. <laughs> um, but I don't, I can, I'm amazed how far we've come from when I started to now, where one of the ladies in our department was a PharmD, which was an additional degree besides a a bachelor of science in pharmacy and she was the only one in her class the only female in her class and that was another barrier like okay we'll let women be pharmacists but then this additional degree work they were 
there seems like there still was a barrier there into women jumping to that level first. Now, it's come light years now, and there are more women than men, I think, in many pharmacy schools. Uh, but I think it's it's odd to me how like some of these barriers that they were having were not that far removed from us even today. Or I was lucky to have even had 20 years older than this woman to, to have had an easier time. Just an interesting And I, if maybe if more women had worked together, and maybe that is how. Go ahead, Amy. Well, I mean, it's just a thought, but I wonder if some of it is systemic. So, like, in various professions, like, do you want to be the secretary or do you want to be the CEO? Or like for lawyers, you know, the choice used to be between being a paralegal, which was predominantly female, but the lawyers were predominantly male. Doctors predominantly were male and the nurses were predominantly female. So I wonder if those gender dynamics play in. And like, if you're the nurse versus the doctor, at least how it's portrayed is the doctor is giving instructions and orders to the nurse. So you know, same thing with lawyers, same thing with executives and their secretaries, like there's a power dynamic in that and the gender kind of overlays it. So I wonder if, because like Elizabeth's ambition was to be the doctor, because of the system she was in and those power dynamics, I wonder if that played into her perception of the value of nurses, which we looking back and now we see how valuable all of those roles are, but those power issues are kind of in play too. I wonder if that's a factor. I don't think they are because you need to remember that a lot of these professions, you know, again, take yourself out of today's mindset and look at what was going on then. These, these quote, and I'm using quotes here, professions weren't actually the same as what we have today. There weren't professional associations. They weren't codified. There weren't a lot of standards. And so you know, it, it didn't take a lot to be a lawyer, for example. You could read a few books and call yourself a lawyer. And the same was true in a lot of cases with medical professionals. You didn't have the professionalization of these fields. And so I think that she probably would have preferred seeing, you know, um, people trailing her, other women trailing her, as opposed to nurses. And a lot of times, you know, nurses actually are better trained than doctors in some instances. So it's, you know, they're, they're, they're doing the work in the field. I, um, I, might, I might respectfully disagree, Sue, it, it, because it, it was exactly at this time that professionalization of the medical, of the MIC, of, of, of the medical industrial complex was happening. I think in that, that I mean, maybe that, so, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I'd say, I'm going to put one foot in both parts of the argument here because uh, if I can, and, and um, because um, I mean, 19 mid 19th century was Semmelweis's time, for example, that even um, as he was the tension with the, pro, the, with the professionalization is that, you know, when we do the, when the hospitals develop and the, the sort of the conceptualization of the physician as the top dog, as opposed to, it could be a nurse, it could be a midwife, it could be anybody, that that very sort of notion of this um, hierarchical um, and patriarchal um, distribution was coming on. I think that's um, sometimes, uh, um, Elizabeth Blackwell was sort of coming into a system that was becoming very masculinized. And I think sort of speaking to Jeff's point of, of the fact that if we look at, we shouldn't regard um, the female um, of medical arts as inferior, but we also are, in this narrative that they are, I mean, I guess that, um, so this whole notion of sort of wanting to be accepted by the new system, by the new, um, that you're getting, I mean, I think Elizabeth Blackwell saw the, the writing on the wall that, that she had to be the exceptional woman. I mean, to use Amy's word of systemic. 
she had to be this the exceptional woman, even though, yes, there were lots of other women. I think the only way you get recognized or are able to go forward when the system is starting to change is to become that. And and um, Florence Nightingale, there can't there can be many Elizabeth Blackwells that follow in Elizabeth Blackwell's path, but there can't be another Florence Nightingale ever again because the system is the the, the system is different than, than it was. It's, I think it's pretty complicated, though. I agree. I think it's complicated, but I think that you know it. The the actual medical profession didn't really start gelling until what nineteen twenty ish. So I'd say it, I'd it, say eighteen ninety at 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 the at the latest because we have you know think about Holmes Hospital in that. Yeah, but I, I, let me look this up. I would say based on the book, um, it was really after. And again, we're going back to systemic sexism. It was when the uh, like when the Blackwell School closed because they closed because the other colleges started taking women and that's when it became yep. more things became more and so that would have been I think that was like the 1890s I think well, yeah uh, I, I would say between the 19th century I know it was before world world war one let's put yes. it that way so it's it's okay. pre that but I think it's 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 one of where you know you've you and you've got two different cultures here so that with Florence Nightingale there's there's a different tradition in Europe with women um, being seen as, uh, you know, I'm thinking back on some of the Catholic hospitals where women were were the the caregivers, um, but you know within the United States it's it's a different it's it really is a melting pot and looking at, you know when when did things happen and why. I think um, um, the U.S. might be have been more strident than than Europe. I mean, in Europe, there. Um, well, I don't know everything about all of Europe, but um, the Germany is really the only country that I can speak to where I I don't think there was ever as quite of a definitive break between so-called professional and the um, and the more um, holistic uh, types of medical practices as as there is as there was here well I, I think it's kind of telling that in England especially they call nurses sisters which really goes back to that whole yeah the nuns were the ones who were usually taking care of people <laughs> um uh, but yeah that's an interesting look at it but I mean at the same time Florence Nightingale was from the noble class, she had money, she was just considered an eccentric who never married. Um, but then at the same time, she was able to twist, it'd be like, well, women are the caregivers, so of course we're gonna be nurses. Um, and she really sold people on that point. And I wonder if she would have had as much success if she had come from like, say, middle class, like Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, so I don't know, I mean, it's, there's so many things that go into making all of these people who they are and, and how history sees them. You can't just pin it down on one thing. Jack. I'd just like to say, I mean, first of all, the classic um, point of professionalization was the Flexner Report, which appeared in about 1912. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that all medical schools were required to conform with the so-called scientific medicine. And that before that, there there were in fact a lot of little medical schools that did all sorts of different things. And in Cincinnati, there was a little women's medical school for a while, um, associated with the Presbyterian Hospital, and it was called the Laura Medical School. And it, it was graduating six or eight women a year. And there are complicated reasons why it closed down. Um, but it, it had to do with, um, as, as everything since the beaches, it had to do with skull buffering within the Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. um, the, the hospital was closed, but th there, there were women practicing medicine. There was an Ohio, uh, Ohio dispensary for women and children was operating from the 
1870s through through the 19 teens, and Elmira Howard was involved with that. Um, I think that I think that um, there, if if you really look, you'll find that there were a lot of women in Cincinnati practicing medicine between about 1880 and 1920. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let's, just, let's move on to Emily a little bit. Talk about her. We talked a lot about Elizabeth. Um, and can we, Emily, we can go into Elizabeth and Emily's uh, dynamic as well. But I guess um, one of the things, first of all, that I had mentioned already that I found interesting was that Elizabeth, because she trailblazed, she actually made it harder for Emily to become a doctor, which you wouldn't think would happen, but Emily actually had more trouble get, getting it, opening doors. And I, my assumption is that the men who helped Elizabeth suffered consequences. She, the men Emily was running into wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't want to suffer the same consequences. Um, but I guess it's just uh, Emily and the differences between their two approaches to medicine. What did you think about their relationship, the sisters, and their approaches to medicine? Just In some ways, I think that Emily did not have as much agency because she was pretty much told from a young age, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. Yeah. I'm going to do this and then you're going to follow me and be my partner in becoming a doctor. And so, you know, maybe she would have liked to be, maybe she could come to that on her own, but maybe not. Maybe she would have gone in a different direction if she wasn't like constantly being pushed and told that this was what she was going to do. Yeah, I wonder if she would have become an astronomer because that was her first love. <laughs> and Elizabeth was like, no, you're not doing that. So she talked about astronomy a lot. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of the big differences is, you know, because Elizabeth hurt her eye, she was basically kind of, she, she had some limitations. And I thought that the dynamics between them when they kind of started feuding was because Elizabeth really wanted to focus on like teaching and using the infirmary for teaching. And Emily wanted to be a surgeon. She wanted to do more clinical stuff and actually be practicing. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And I kind of liked it when Elizabeth went back to England and Emily was, because at one point Emily was ready to quit. She was like, I'm done with this. As soon as I get enough money, I'm out. Um, and then because Elizabeth went back to England, it's like Julia, or I should say Julia, I watched the show Murdoch and there's a doctor on there named Julia Ogden. I, and that's in my brain, so sorry. But Emily, it's like she kind of found her voice once Elizabeth left because like, you know, Christina was saying, you know, Elizabeth was telling her what she was going to do. And it was like, once she was gone, Emily kind of found what she wanted to do. And she, you know, whether she wanted to be a doctor, I don't know, but she at least in the end seemed to make peace with it and found a way to make it work for her. Mm -hmm. And she seemed to be very happy. She got a partner, one of her students, she adopted a child. So I was kind of impressed with that. I was kind of happy for her. She got her happy, because she had mentioned when she was younger, all she wanted was a friend. <laughs> and she was hoping Elizabeth would be that friend. <laughs> and then, you know, she actually did find a friend in the end. There you go. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. So. Any other thoughts on Emily? No, and I just saw one other thing. I thought it was interesting because she says she wants a friend that the doctor Nancy Clark came to her graduation and gave her roses, yet she would not extend the same friend the friendship to Nancy Clark. Mm -hmm. When Nancy came to Scotland, she would not help her get in. And it was that same idea. She had broken the barriers to get in, and she was not gonna let another woman get in because she had to be the exception. It's kind of that same idea. She couldn't extend that hand to her. Just like Elizabeth had done to so many women. So that was interesting. They could have had a lifelong friendship if she had done that. <laughs> I don't know. Any other thoughts on so it was more 
almost more of an adversarial role between Black Hill sisters and other women as opposed to a camaraderie. But it was interesting because Elizabeth, they both kept talking about lifting women up, but then they were fighting the women that they were wanted that wanted to be lifted up and telling them they were worthless and they were doing it all wrong. So I thought that was interesting because it wasn't their way. Well, I mean, I do think that that does speak to the, you used the word exceptionalism, and I absolutely would underscore that. I mean, this is a story that is not popularly told about um, African-American literature, uh, um, African-American uh, literati at the, about at the same time, and how very badly Booker T. Washington treated Pauline Hopkins um, to the point where today you do not hear the name of Pauline Hopkins very much, um, but you should. Everybody go look up um, Pauline Hopkins and read some of her novels. Um, but anyhow, but because he actually behind the scenes went as far as um, um, at tearing down her uh, public, um, her public, uh, her newly built publishing industry, um, publicly defaming her and so forth um, to the point where there could be only one um, exceptional um, African-American um, literary scholar, even though Pauline Hopkins actually formed the um, National Association of Colored Women, which was the predecessor to the NAACP. But anyhow, here you have it. Nobody knows who Pauline Hopkins is. I go back to Amy's word, systemic, when you know that there's only so much room in the narrative um, for then you have to sort of lean into becoming the exceptional the, the exception if you want your work to be done even if it's ironic and hypocritical even if you're th saying things like um you know african-american uplift or women's uplift or something like that um but it's 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 an ugly truth but i don't know if it's unique the fact that, that the the blackwell you know that elizabeth blackwell in particular was doing this i don't think that's um unique unfortunately i did find like i said i did though find it unique that with the college i think elizabeth not elizabeth emily as you were saying that i was thinking because she did start to mentor her students in her last 30 years that's how she ended up with, uh, I'm sorry, I forget her partner's name, the, but she, she ended up, her best her bestie, she and her bestie had a house together. I'm just going to leave it a partner. I don't know if there's more or not. They never mentioned it, but. Um, and that was another, I thought it was really funny. Did, it, did everyone get the part where Elizabeth was bragging about how her patients were trying to kiss her? Because <laughs> they were so enthralled with her. And it's like, and then I think the author made a pun like, the lady doth protest too much. Like, yes. yes. With Elizabeth and, and she just wanted to make sure she wasn't really doing that. But it was these crazy women kissing her. Not, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't kissing them. They were kissing her. I thought that was kind of a funny, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but it was just kind of funny that she even brought that up. Um, I think the other thing I thought was interesting was when Elizabeth started teaching classes, and I'm going back to Elizabeth, I'm sorry. Even though she had very uh, conservative ideas about marriage and sex, I thought it was interesting that she was teaching women how to enjoy sex in marriage. I can't, I mean, because like, again, I watch a lot of Victorian shows and like women doctors were routinely arrested for teaching that kind of stuff. And she was like showing pictures and talking about the clitoris and this, you know, like, wow, I can't believe she got away with that. And that they just let her, like, that was like, too, and that's how she attracted crowds to her. And they were like, oh, let's go hear about this. But the, and but she didn't believe in birth control. She believed in the rhythm method. She was okay with that. So she was kind of like Catholic in that way. Because the Romans, you know, she kind of had that Pope mentality, I guess. Um, but she wanted them to limit family size using the rhythm, the rhythm, the rhythm method. She didn't have a name for it at that time. But I thought it was kind of funny that she was teaching women how to enjoy sex. And apparently she never had sex because she never married. <laughs> so this was all inclusive exercise. We read about it in the book. There you go. All right. Well, do we have like one last topic that you want to, or one last theme that you want to talk about? Uh -huh. That was like the sexism. But yeah, I think we covered everything. I don't can't do anything else. Anybody felt interesting about the book 
that they wanted to share that kind of surprised them. Can I just say, Desiree, I, that was awesome that you brought that up. That that topic alone, we could talk about for hours. Um, this is Mary Ann. I was just going to say, um, after listening to everything, I'm going to go on and finish the book. Um. Can I can I ask if um I I never saw something come up come up with um I'm totally serious with um Marianne with um if you feel like saying hey here's where you go where um we should go and um and here's a good day for everybody to come um, well let me see I'm trying to figure out how to I uh, text everyone or chat to everyone to um. Click here, everyone. See how easy that was, Marianne? Okay, uh, sorry. You've got this, Marianne, we believe in you. Yay. I, you know, it's just sometimes that I don't bother doing something till it's time to do it. And you know, um, so I'm almost there. I'm giving you my email and my cell. And um, there we go. Um, oh, now I almost accidentally left the whole thing. There we go. I'm back. So did that go through? I, yeah, I think it did. Oh, and like, okay. seriously, it'd be so cool if you shout out a day because like, oh my gosh, like Marianne, Sue, all these folks on here that have this wealth of information who I have never met in IRL and would love, like, it would be so cool if we ended up hooking, hooking up on a, on a, a particular day over there in Glendale. Well, we do have some historical documents coming out of Iron Mountain that are from DC, New York, Philadelphia, some of our earliest records. And some of those have connections. Well, they all have connections to Cincinnati because the church was early. Um, and there was a Mary Breckenridge. I just might want to say, if you watch Kentucky PBS, there's the angels on horseback, absolutely wonderful. Once again, it's women with money, not having access to serve. And that's where they found a place, you know? So they're, you know, um, and then the other one, I'll drop a name that needs more research. There's an Eckstein school in Glendale, which was saved, and Eleanor Eckstein. Um, I don't know too much about her, but the school was named after her. And, you know, we can talk about that because that's a Glendale story. Um, but I do find her working with the Sanitation Commission in Cincinnati during the Civil War in what is now Washington Park. So I was going to say there was a lot of women, um, you know, there's an article of the women who attended and worked on the soldiers. So anyway, I'll quit talking again. Going back like 20, 30 minutes when we were talking about midwives, I almost brought up Mary Breckenridge. And she, because I, I did some research on her when I was in grad school back in the 90s. But she basically was from a wealthy Kentucky family. She lost her two children to mm -hmm. disease when they were young. And so she went back to, she divorced her husband and went to France to learn, you know, midwifery and made it into a profession for women and brought nurse midwives to Appalachian, Kentucky. And they became the medical professionals in Appalachian, Kentucky. And they were, they, they visited their clients on horseback. That's why they were called the midwives on horseback. But um, Yeah, and, and, and Christina, to add to that, to add to that, if anybody wants to watch that, it's off of KET. If okay. you've got the mobile app, you can switch your PBS stations and look for Kentucky Life, and that's where it is. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. We have had a wonderful discussion. I appreciate everyone coming out today and tuning in from home. And uh, thank you for the great discussion. Thank you to Desiree for her um, pulling all of this together and getting us to think about these great topics. 
And again, if you haven't read the book, but you want to, you can buy it probably anywhere, but we do have a few used copies at the Harry Beecher Stonehouse's bookstore right now. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and sign off, but thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Desiree. Thank you. Sorry, nice I'm meeting you all. Oh, nice to meet you. Okay, do you know what the next book is? Oh, um, yes, the next book, June. Sorry, I should have said something. The next book in June, I don't remember the name, but it's it's basically about the lane runs. And um, if I I'm going to reconnect, but we, the author is uh, teaches in at Taylor University in Indiana, and I believe he is going to come and be part of the, the book discussion. So Ooh. I reconnect with that. Make sure I, sh I should have done that this week. I got busy. So I will reconnect with him, make sure. And then um, I will, the, all of the information for that book should already be on our website in terms of that's the next book, which is at the June, the June Summit Bowling Club. Um, it's Jeff Oberly and it's something like The Light of Knowledge and it's specifically about yeah. James Lee and the uh, Lane Rocks. So. Yes, I looked it up. It's The Light of Knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. We hope to see you in June or before because we have lots of other programs going on. But thank you all. Thank you. It's nice to meet Thanks. you all. Thank Thanks you. Good to see everybody. <laughs>